Good morning or good afternoon, depending on when you're joining us from today, and a very warm welcome to everyone. Today we'll be covering effective load restraint, and we have a special guest presenter from Blue Scope Steel. Now, this particular webinar is part of the National Road Safety Partnership Program webinar series, and uh, a little bit of information on that for those of you unaware. The NRSPP has been established to provide a collaborative network for Australian businesses and organisations to help them create a positive and safe, uh, um, positive road safety culture both internally and externally. It aims to help organisations of all sizes across all sectors to share and build road safety initiatives specific to their own workplace and beyond. It's delivered by ARB and funded primarily by Government Coalition and ARB. For more information and more tools like this webinar, please refer to the NRSPP website. Now, as I said, we've got a very special webinar presenter joining us today, and I'll introduce him in one moment. My name is Angela Juhas, and I will be your friendly webinar moderator today. If you do experience any issues along the way or you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch with me at any time. Now, for today's session, we've allowed approximately 60 minutes total. Uh, about 40 minutes of that will be spent on the presentation and uh, we'll be taking questions throughout. So please don't be shy, get your questions through to us and we'll be happy to uh, deal with those as we go. We are also recording today's session, ladies and gentlemen, and so there's no need to take notes. All of the presentation material as well as the recording will be sent to you once the webinar has concluded. Now, as I mentioned before, we welcome questions and discussion, and uh, if you would uh, just look over to your control panel, you'll notice a questions box. We ask that you type those in here, and I'll make sure that uh, Graham gets them throughout the presentation and uh, gets back to you on those. Now, without any further ado, I will uh, introduce our man of the moment. So his name is Graham Agnew. Now, Graham is a logistics engineer with Blue Scope Steel and is recognised as a leading expert in the field of load restraint and transport safety in the Australian steel industry, having worked or consulted for various companies including Bluescope, Arium and Stramit. With over 20 years operational and technical experience across manufacturing and transport functions, Graham has developed a practical, hands-on approach to load restraint. He is a mechanical engineer and also holds a Master's of Business and Technology through the University of New South Wales. His current role as a logistics engineer with Blue Scope, he's been responsible for developing cost-effective and efficient transport safety solutions, including the load restraint of a wide variety of loads, as well as coaching and mentoring of drivers, loaders, supervisors and managers in their application. A very warm welcome to you, Graham, on this rather cold winter's day here in Melbourne. How are you going today? Good, Angela. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And thank you for your time in uh, preparing today's presentation and uh, delivering it for our audience. I'm sure we're all very keen to learn more about the good work of uh, our Blue Scope Steel and, and this particular, particular initiative. So uh, I'll hand over to you. Okay, Angela. Absolute pleasure. All right. So, um, so Firstly, I thought I'd just give you a bit of background into um, who Blue Scope Steel are, um, just so you can understand where we come from around this issue of load restraint. Um, basically, um, we are a global manufacturer and supplier of steel products and solutions. Basically, across the world, we're um, in 17 countries employing over 17,000 people. Uh, we have more than 50 facilities across um, the Pacific region and nearly 100 distribution centres just here in Australia with almost 8,000 people. As far as that, we also operate the largest um, steelworks in Australia here at Port Kembla, which is where I'm based. Um, and basically that has an annual production capacity of around about 2.6 million tonnes of crude steel. Um, I'm sure many people have probably seen some of our uh, brands in the past, um, things like Colourbond, you'll see those ads on television, products like Zig Balloon, Lysart, and in the last 18 months or so we've acquired a couple of other well-known businesses in the Australian steel industry, builders and Warcon Steel. 
important part to understand about that is what Blue Scope is. Blue Scope is actually not a transport operator. Um, basically, less than 1% of our transport tasks would actually be done on company owned vehicles. So, primarily, we are a loader, packer, consigner, or receiver of. One of the things, though, that has happened um, in that time is back in the, about the mid 1990s, Blue Scope, um, who was BHP Steel back in those days, realised that securing heavy steel products on trucks was a major risk to its employees, contractors, and the community, um, and basically started looking at ways to minimise that risk. Um, across the steel industry, we have seen a number of serious incidents, which have included fatalities, and basically um, that has occurred to both drivers and also other road users as the result of having loads that were incorrectly restrained. Um, across Blue Scope itself, Blue Scope is recognised as a leader in safety within the steel industry um, worldwide. And basically, one of the things that we do is we manage our high risk activities, what we call codes of practice. These are codes which sit across all our business businesses, and basically they set out the minimum standards for um, sites um, and also our service providers to adhere to. And those high risk include activities such as mobile equipment, overhead cranes, product storage, and load restraint. All up, there's about 12 of those. Um, codes of practice in our business. And as we said, labour strain is considered one of our major risks and hence has one of those codes of practice attached to it. All right, so that's just a bit of a background as to you know where we come from and why we take this so seriously. Um, and that's probably where the real story begins is right now and here as to what is effective labour strain. Um, and look, I understand that the Blue Scope approach to labour restraint is probably not right for every organisation, but if you adopt two of the key models that we're going to discuss, um, it's possible to demonstrate compliance. And when I look at what that compliance looks like, um, you know, I regularly hear people like the regulators talk about chain of responsibility, and they kind of talk about three things. They talk about information and instruction, training and auditing, and I'll go into those in a bit of detail. Because it is a holistic system that you need in order to manage load restraint. So if I look firstly at information and instruction, you know, we need to make sure that um, our people, both our employees and contractors, know how the load is to be put on the vehicle, what the vehicle and equipment is required, to restrain the load and how that restrained equipment must be applied. Secondly, uh, we need to ensure that our personnel are trained and competent to complete the tasks that they need to do. And finally, the second part is the auditing section. So do work practices comply with instructions? Are personnel appropriately skilled? And is the equipment being maintained? And generally speaking, when I hear the regulators actually talk about compliance with um, COR requirements, such as load restraint, that third element, that auditing phase, that supervision, making sure people are actually complying with those systems, generally the one they say is fairly poorly done. But look, the focus of today's webinar is to show you how we manage um, load restraint using two different models, um, basically, and to show how that we stop loads from coming off trucks and causing damage to both people and product. All right. So, as I said, um, the thing with Blue Scape is that we are not a transport company primarily. We primarily are a consigner. And really, as far as consigning, uh, the, to have an effective system, your contract management is the actual vital element of that. Transport providers, 
who work for Blue Scope still are basically expected to sign up to what we call the Australian um, Steel Industry Logistics Safety Code. And that safety code was actually developed by um, both Blue Scope and One Steel, and it's actually aligned with the actual National Logistics Safety Code. Um, basically, what that code requires is that contractors and sites that are working for us have evidence that they've met a number of key criteria. So they make sure that we have they've trained their people, that their load of strain equipment is um, it's up to standard, meets the meets the relevant requirements, and that they actually have guidelines around how those loads must be trained on their vehicles. Um, so what we're basically doing by going through that code and auditing our contractors against that is actually pre-qualifying those contractors before they actually even come onto site. So when I talk about the two different models that we use, and these are, these are the two real models that you can have in your business. The first one is what I would call a contractor-based system. And basically this is where you would go to the contractor and basically get them to develop engineer load restraint system. So what we do is we say to the contractor, look, you've got some expertise in this, you come to us with a system that meets the right, uh, the legislative requirements for load restraint. Uh, we then would review that system and if it's acceptable, we would approve them for them to use it. We then would monitor that system through our contracts management process. And basically, part of that would be our contractors showing us their compliance around um, auditing, and also their compliance around, um, you know, what if they've had an incident, how they actually have managed that, and what corrective actions they've actually implemented to prevent further breaches from occurring. Um, it is from a contractor point of view, the actual sorry, from a consignor point of view, it is the simplest solution. Okay, because what we're doing is we're getting them to do the work in the background around developing the system and we are simply monitoring that. However, in our experience, most of our contractors don't have the engineering resources to be able to develop an engineered load restraint system. So what we've basically done is in most cases, we've adopted what I call the consignor model, where basically we have a team of specialised and experienced in-house engineers, and basically what we do is um, we develop guidelines for them based on our knowledge of load restraint and also the different products, and basically allow the contractors to adopt those. And as I said, the vast majority of cases, that's what happens within our business. Okay, so as far as um, information instruction, uh, I'll talk a little bit about this now. So why is it so important to have an engineered load restraint system? So I would compare this to driving down the highway and I'm going to go over a bridge. You know, I want to make sure that when I go over that bridge that somebody has some due diligence into that. Okay, so they've made sure that they've, when they're designing that bridge, that they've taken account of the, you know, the weight of the vehicles going over that that bridge. You know, this that, that bridge can take the loading of the wind, trying to push it sideways. You know, you don't want to go over that bridge thinking, oh, you know what, the labourer on this job was the guy who selected size and the strength of the, uh, of the metal girders that we're going into. When I drive next to a truck out on the road, I want to know that somebody has also put that same level of diligence. The reality of that though is in most cases, the restraint of most loads out on our roads are left up to, to the driver. And 
The truth of that is that most drivers basically don't have any training around load restraint or have very limited training. And most of them don't understand the principles of load restraint. I'll give you an example of that. A couple of years ago, I was training a driver who was new to our business. And he came up to me at the end of the session and he said, look, he said, I've been driving a truck for 20 years. And he goes, no one before today had actually told me what the legal requirements were for load restraint until you stood up at the top of this class. To me, that was fairly scary to think that someone could do a job for 20 years and not understand, not know there was a legal requirement for the job that they were actually doing. All right. So what are the legal requirements? So for people who don't know, the legislation around load restraint in Australia comes out of the report that you see on the right hand side. It's called the National Transport Commission Load Restraint Guide. Um, in that guide, it sets out performance standards which the load must be restrained. And that performance standards are shown there in that diagram. But, uh, to comply with the legislative requirements for road transport here in Australia, basically you must restrain 80% of the load in the forward direction. So if I had a 10 tonne load, I'd have to have the equivalent of 8 tonne of restraint. 50% sideways and rearwards, um, 10 tonne load, I would need 5 tonne of restraint. Vertically, 20%. So 10 tonne load, I would need to have 2 tonne of restraint. Now, that's not as easy as it sounds. And to, to, to make you understand that a little bit better, another example I was out. Um, I looked at a load once a couple of years ago and I actually went up to the driver and I asked the driver how much restraint did he have on that load. And the driver basically said, oh it's simple, he said up to 10 tonne I need two chains. So I asked the driver how did he work that out and what he said to me was that basically he needed to restrain 80% of the weight forward so that was 8 tonne and basically then two four tonne chains is in a tonne of restraint. Unfortunately it's not that simple as we'll see shortly and hence the reason why we need to have an engineering system. The other requirements that the law also requires are set out in those performance standards is that the load should not become dislodged from the vehicle and the load cannot adversely affect the vehicle ability or weight distribution when it sees one of those forces outlined in the Graham, sorry to cut you off there. Um, I just, I've had a couple of uh, our audience members just note that your audio is a little bit fading in and out. Um, I just wanted to make sure that the microphone is all clear at your end. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, um, as far as I'm aware, yes. Okay, beautiful. Thank you. That's no better? Yes. Okay, so as I said, the reality is it's not that simple. Um, the truth is that load restraint is actually a science. Um, generally speaking, the load restraint relies on three mechanism, mechanisms um, to prevent the load from moving frictional force created by the weight of the load itself, the frictional force created by the clamping force applied by the restraints and the strength of their equipment used to restrain the load either by blocking, containing or attaching to the load. So, you might to look at an engineered load restraint system the way that we would do it. Um, in the way that it needs to be done regardless of whether or not you're working on the contractor based model or the 
for the consigner based model is starting with the MCC load restraint performance standards. You can see that there over on the left hand side, we then model that particular load and basically um, put it into a model, a whole heap of calculations that basically look at all the potential failure modes for that load. Things like sliding, toppling and rotating. And then we take those um, equations and we put it into what we call the load restraint guideline for that product, which is then the documentation driver and the load is received. What makes this even more complex is that many of the variables used in these calculations are not straightforward either. So, um, experience has shown us that in a lot of cases the actual load actually works and behaves a lot differently um, to what we would have expected. So what we actually have to do is actually go off and test those assumptions to and val to validate them. What we're trying to do here is create a real world situation um, so that we can we can verify those assumptions. So the things that we would do that would be things like the friction between surfaces, impact different low con impact with different load configurations, the behavior of restraint, the restraints, stretch the restraints, the different tensions, you know, will that restraint actually tension up? And the other thing that we actually look at would be the performance of the packaging, because the packaging, as we'll discuss shortly, plays an vital role in the actual load restraint. Okay, so what we then do is we basically have a number of different types of testing that we do, and I've got some photos there on the screen that you can see, and I'll go, I'll I'll talk about these because these are some of the trials that we actually did last year on something that you see quite often out on the road, the bulk bags. Um, so you can actually see there where we've got some tilt testing, we also sometimes refer to as static testing. So if you look at the NCC guideline, what they will talk about in that guideline is that if you tilt the load up to a certain angle, you can simulate a point eight, so 80 percent forwards or the 50 percent sideways. Um, so as I said, some bulk bags. I'll show you a little video of some testing that we did. So you can see there we did some testing and obviously that was a fail. Uh, one of the things we started to do when we were testing, started testing these bulk bags was found that the coefficient of friction with those bulk bags on tipper pallets was actually much lower than what we actually assumed that it would be initially looking at it. So then we took those bags and we actually did what we call some drag test, friction test. You can see there where we've, um, the photo where we've actually bolt bag down on the ground, we've got a forklift connected that up with a chain, to the forklift we have a load cell to then measure the peak, um, the peak force and then we can determine what the actual friction value is. Um, after doing that we actually were able to get the required friction by actually placing some rubber on the deck, we did some more tilt testing and then we went to what we call dynamic testing. Now dynamic testing is very similar to the crash test dummy type where we've actually put the load on a truck, run it down a vacant isolated stretch of road and basically um, on one of our sites and basically slammed on the brakes and actually the restraint. Measure, we have a decelerometer that actually measures the actual 
deceleration of the actual load. 40 kilometer per hour test. So yeah, that's the type, that's the, in developing an engineering load restraint system, that's the type of extent you need to go to. So as I said, that due diligence type um, approach. So look, it has been fairly technical up to this point. Um, the thing to understand though is when you're doing this with the actual audience that you're catering for. So yep, yeah, we've done this technical, a lot of technical work, but now I need to do something the loader and the driver that they're going to understand. So I need to use um, language that they understand and I want to try and cut down on the number of texts and, and also photos and actually use diagrams. So the, one of the things is drivers want to be able to look at their load and basically then look at a photo and go, need to go well, my load needs to look like that. So if you look at those two photos, you can actually see that actually occurring. The other thing that our guidelines certainly focus on is what we call the five fundamentals of load restraint. So one of the things that we've actually done is we've done a lot of analysis over the years of our load restraint instruments. And what we've found is that in the majority of cases, we can relate it back to one of five fundamental principles. These being packaging, friction, dunnage, no gaps, and also the number of restraints. So I'll talk a bit more about each of those. So the first one is packaging. And one of the things that you kind of look at as you go through and actually look at those five fundamentals is actually how many of these actually are the responsibility of the designer more so than what they are the actual loader. In a lot of cases probably the first four are and certainly packaging will always be the responsibility of the designer. Okay so the packaging, one of the things to understand about it is it must meet the performance standards. It must be able to withstand the 80% the and the 20% because it needs to be able to hold that object together as one solid item on the vehicle. Now, it's near impossible for a driver to correctly restrain the load if the packaging is not right. So what we have in our business is a series of critical procedures um, for packaging and basically you can see there an example of it that comes out of our distribution business for small parts and basically the operators are basically trained and audited against those procedures. As far as um, fundamental number two is friction and really this is the most important of those fundamentals. Okay, it is more important than the number of restraints. You want to make sure that if you've got low friction surfaces, things like steel on steel, plastic on plastic, plastic on steel, breaking those up with something like a rubber The third fundamental that we talk about is dunnage. Um, so we also, the guidelines will spell out things like the correct size and type of dunnage and how it must be orientated on the truck. So you can see there over in the, in the cutout, the example of the good and the bad. Okay, we don't want things like rectangular dunnage on its thin edge because it's very easy for that to roll. And that creates real, real problems because it allows the restraints to lose. One of the other things we talk about is that how to eliminate gaps. Okay, so you can see there an example. Again, the cross for the bad, the tick for the good. If I've got gaps in loads, that's going to allow my restraints to lose and my restraints to become ineffective. So as I said, a lot of those first four, in a lot of cases, do come down to the actual consigner, the people actually loading the load. Not always, but in a lot of cases that, that is the case. The one that the drivers 
have definitely have the actual um, responsibility for is actually making sure they have the number of restraints. So what we try to do here is take out all those complex calculations and do that up front for the driver and then that driver and the table for the number of restraints to, to, to actually determine how many restraints you need. So if you look at that table there, it's fairly easy. If I was to have 12 tonne of that product, I would need to have three chains on that load. So one of the other key things about these guidelines is basically their availability. Um, basically those guidelines are available to employees and contractors online uh, through a couple of different systems. We also display those guidelines clearly at dispatch points. So you can see there, there's some photos there of one of our sites and you can actually see those guidelines clearly on display at the Weybridge area there on the site. Um, drivers are also required to carry a copy of those guidelines um, that are relevant to their load with the new trucks. And we actually audit that as part of our audit process. Some cases though we will also take that engineered load restraint system one step further and actually also not only the guideline or the technical procedure, um, but we'll also have to design some type of equipment to go with it. So why do we do that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Sometimes the restraint can be um, complicated. So one of the things we're trying to do whenever we do this is try and simplify the method of restraint. Just the number of steps the driver and the loaders have to perform so we can um, reduce the potential for human error and also increase the efficiency. When you do that, you want to think about things like using systems that block and contain the load because what that will allow you to do is actually reduce the number of restraints required. Um, there's an example there where you can actually see where we've done that. We had some, we had a lot ongoing order for some foils um, down in Victoria last year and basically what we had to do was because these pools are so narrow and the potential for them to topple, you can see how we developed a technical document that actually went with this piece of equipment that we actually developed to allow that to um, that product to occur and to be moved safely. Okay. Um, so as I said earlier, the guidelines, that information, that instruction part is just the first element. Um, the, other, the second element that I want to just go through is our load restraint training. Um, you know, basically, regardless of whether or not you, did, you adopt either a consigner model or a or the contractor model, you need to make sure that our loaders and our drive and our drivers. Are So contractually, Bluescape requires that drivers be trained and competent. So all contract drivers are required to do that. Um, we also train our employees as well. And why do we do that? Because we want them to recognise high risk situations and um, so they're empowered to basically prevent non-compliant loads from the other side. Um, our training basically is available both online face to and face to face. Um, a large focus of that training is actually those five fundamentals that we spoke about. So you can see there are a couple of slides there that actually show the type of things we do. Fundamental two, low friction. Fundamental three, the, the dangers of dunnage. One of the things we also do with our training is we use a large library of incidents that we've collected over 20 odd years to provide impact and the reasons behind the requirements. So here we have a case here around one of those fundamentals and that was the rolling dunnage, the rectangular dunnage on its thin edge. Basically a driver in this case had that rectangular dunnage on its thin edge. Basically that dunnage rolled when he applied the brakes at a rail crossing and basically allowed the chains to come forward 
and basically the load slip fall into the back of the cabin and crush that drive. Um, so you can see there, that's the type of thing that will really give impact. I recently was training some drivers who were going to start to carry this exact same product and when I was able to say to them, look, here's a fatality with exactly the same product you are carrying, you can start to see the effect that would have on somebody in their needs of their right. One of the other things that we are now doing is also starting to develop training videos uh, um, to try and show people exactly someone actually doing it. So I'm going to play one of those so you can actually see where we're, where we're headed with it. I'm sorry, would you mind turning the volume up a little bit? So that there is just an example, that's a, one of our shorter ones, there are two different versions of that, there's a long one which goes into a lot of the detail that the driver would have as part of his initial training and that version there is more just for a refresher. Um, so different types of training, we have both awareness and training and competency based training and that depends on the person's role. For example, um, you know, we, we've got a salesperson in one of our small regional branches. We don't need them to have the same level of detail as the driver or the loader, but we also want them to have some understanding of what those high risk situations are. So if they see something out on site, they can actually stop that load from going out incorrectly with strain. They may also have a discussion with a customer who's going to pick it up around what the requirements are. So we want them to have some awareness of what those of what the requirements are. The things with the but for people like drivers and loaders, there are higher requirements, which are the competency-based requirements. Basically, our drivers require are required to complete theoretical tests, um, and basically that is also around some of the stuff we've seen. And basically, that then is also tested practically. They are audited by their supervisor on their first load to actually confirm their practical competency. Um, the, record of the, the record of that competency is then actually put into the driver's passport so that if anyone goes to order that driver out on site, it's very easy to verify whether or not that driver has the right training. That training is then refreshed every three years. So the driver is required to go through that process every three years or if there's a major revision an actual guideline they're all saying need to do as well. Okay, the third element um, of an effective load restraint system is actually monitoring and supervising that, that, um, that system and we do that through our auditing process. Um, as I said earlier, this is the one that when I hear the regulators talk it's not very well done but I'll run you through exactly how we do that. So, you know, 
our contract reviews, whether or not it's contractor based system or a consigner using the contract the consigner model. Basically, our contract review process, we regularly meet with the contractors, and one of the agenda items on that contract reviews is actually the load restraint performance. Um, contractors in that process are required to report on any load restraint failures um, they have. Um, you know what actions they're taking around those failures, and also their audit, um, their audits. And we actually also have comm um, commercial penalties in our contracts with our suppliers for our any. Um, we also monitor loads on an individual basis, and we do that through our load restraint audit program. Basically, annually we review um, our products to determine the risk type. So we put them into a matrix, as you see down the bottom, and basically we look at what that what the risk of that product is based on its um, incident history and also the number of audit failures it had. And then we rank them with either high risk, medium risk, or low risk. And basically we audit you know high high, high risk products every five percent of loads, medium risk three and a half percent, and low risk every um, every half of the percent. I'll talk a bit more about that in one of the next couple of slides. How how the, how we also adjust that in one result. Basically, then what we do is we decide. Then, basically, depending on the number of loads that they actually dispatch and also what the product risk rating is, they actually get an audit target for how many audits they need to complete um, every month. Those load restraint audits come in a standard format. Um, they can be accessed either by hard copy or electronically. So the, the technology is there these days to allow our people to actually enter those using a tablet technology such as an iPad straight directly into the load restraint audit system. Um, what those audits actually do is require checks of essential, those essential requirements, so making sure the actual person's been trained. Um, there's no low friction surfaces um, that the actual, you know, they're following things like correct danish practice, the type, correct type, a number of restraints, and that their equipment is in a good condition. One of the other parts of this as well is it's not just about compliance, it certainly is, but it's also an opportunity to follow up on the driver's training. So often no one talks to the driver about load restraint after he's trained unless somebody does an audit. So it's a good follow-up process for us around that. And it's also an opportunity for drivers and loaders to get their issues resolved. So there's opportunity there on that form to write any comments the driver might have so that we can process that back through the system and we can then look at you know, any changes that might be needed to the guideline. Basically, we have across Australia about 160 different dispatch points. And we would complete somewhere in the vicinity of 3,000 to 3,500 load restraint orders across those sites every month. Um, we, all that information goes into a database, and we actually use that database to identify any changes that may be required in the guideline or any any training requirements. A couple of years ago we had one and used to be some um, statistics in our distribution business that said we could put some work there and basically we organised a major intervention in those sites right across the country and basically training up their people and that type of thing so that we could um, improve their performance and we actually saw a marked improvement and have it since in their performance around load restraint as a result of that and monitoring those trends. Um, across our business, we actually target an audit compliance of 95%. Um, and if a site does not meet that audit compliance of 95%, what we actually do over a three month period if they don't meet that, is those actual targets, that 5% for high risk, um, loads would actually get increased to 7.5%. Okay, they'd need to audit 7.5% of high risk loads of, of loads for the next three months. And then we would continue to monitor that and they wouldn't drop back to the 5.5% 
requirement, the normal requirement, until they've had three months consecutively above the 95 per cent compliance. All right, so the final little section of our um, presentation today is just about the future. Um, I want to give you some ideas of the type of stuff we're starting to look at as far as load restraints concerned. But some of the things that we're starting to do is actually um, develop and use um, smart technology. So we're starting to do things like put GoPros on trailers to actually monitor the loads in transit. So see, you know, see, give us some more guidance on how they actually behave and that type of thing. We're also using it as a bit of a training tool um, to allow us to, you know, show drivers and loaders different parts of the actual process. And we're also developing what we call a um, smartphone app, um, which we're calling Steel Drive. And I'll show you that in a little bit of an example over here. So this is, this is still in development. Um, the actual developer are still developers are telling us that it would be available towards the end of November, early December. But this is, this is where we're going with it. So this is a driver, this is an app that's being developed for our drivers. So it would come into a little screen like this, um, as you can see here, the um, name and password, and then basically when it comes through, it would then um, come into this section here, and basically he can then um, come into here with different locations, and you can see here, like okay, this is my little finger, pretend that's my little finger on the screen there scrolling through, and I click on, it's all touch screen, and you can come down here gets the details of the loading sites, details on the loading sites, that type of thing, and also any, you know, you can click on here. So as I said, some of the data in here is not here yet, but you get the, you get the idea, the PPD requirements, things around um, exclusion zones, that type of thing, any requirements on the site, any facilities, um, and also, you know, the closest way stations and rest stops and petrol stations. If that, um, if that location is part of the driver's uh, favourites, it also will receive notifications. So, for example, um, if that site, the forklift was broken down and we couldn't load for three hours, that's the type of information the driver would notice, not get notification of. So, it gives us some idea of, gives some help us also manage our fatigue management. Um, the other information, look, it's primarily been set up though around load restraint though, and you can actually see um, that basically if I was to click on here, the driver then gets his information on the different guidelines. As I click through, you know, depending on the product, it would tell him how many restraints that he needed to apply. Uh, back over here, if I was to go through, sorry, I'll go back to the uh, Um, you can actually go down here as well, and if I was to click on this one, you would get for that product the video similar to what I showed earlier. Alternatively, you would get, you'd come onto here and you would get a hard copy of the whole product. As I said, the information's not there yet, that's the stuff that it helps. The other part of this as well, um, basically, is what we call load capture. So one of the things that we want to do is um, start to record data from the actual loads and basically two reasons for that. A, we're going to get the driver to actually take a photo of the actual restraint and the reason that we do that is so that it's another process step. Okay, so it's another thing the driver actually has to look at. So he can't have a lapse in concentration and actually something in the process and also it gives us some record of how the load was actually restrained. So as I was to go through this, I would pick the different product that I'm doing, you know, who I've carried for, and then I can click on one of these, take a photo of the load, and then there's a limit of eight photos you can actually take. It goes into this here, database. I, the driver then would press submit, accept, and that then is uploaded to a system, and that stays on that system for a period of 30 days to allow us to review that. Um, the driver can also see that on his smartphone, and basically scroll through and get those details of that particular one. Um, so 
Okay, so thank you very much, guys, for listening today. Um, I hope you've got something out of it, and I'll hand back over to Angela. Thank you so much, Graham. That is a, a brilliant app concept. Um, we have had a couple of questions, and I think it was um, November, December. You said that it was ready to be released. Is that right? So the the, the information that I had from the developers in November in last week was that they were looking at um, late November, early December for implementation as, as the first as the first phase of that. Brilliant. Well, I look forward to seeing the final product. It sounds great. And, and thank you so much for taking the time to deliver this session. I'm, I'm sure that our audience did get a lot out of it. Now, we do have a few questions and uh, unfortunately only 10 minutes remaining in the webinar. So um, I'll, I'll select a few to ask Graham. So I do apologise if we don't uh, have time to address your question today. But uh, Graham's details, as you can see, are on there on your screen. And um, we do welcome you to get in touch any time. Uh, if you'd like to discuss your queries further, I'm sure Graham will be more than happy to take uh, your call or email. Yep. OK, we've had a question here from Mark. Um, Mark is asking, what are your thoughts on restraining loads using standard alloy gates and 2T web straps over the tops of the gates? Um, it depends on the it depends on the load. In a lot of cases, I'd probably say it's not it's, it, it probably doesn't meet the requirements. Um, but I I know of some cases where it can. It, 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 different loads are different. Um, I would personally prefer to see those webbings over the actual load rather than and fed through the gate and actually off clamping down the actual load rather than relying on 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 those webbings holding the gates in place. It does work in some cases with off loads, but I'd be certainly concerned about it trying to um, restrain something like a pallet on a trailer. Great. Thank you for that question, Mark. A question here from John, and uh, John's asking, have you found uh, statements in the load restraint guide that are not in agreement with the blue scope load restraint guidelines? What approach do you take in dealing with such conflicts, uh, given the legal requirements? So for us, um, as I said, one of the things that we do is we actually start with the actual legislation, which is the performance standard. That's the only part of that actual guideline, which is the legislation. The rest of that book is just a load. Okay, so we all our loads actually comply with those performance standards. So that's that's our basis to work from, and we work from here. So the rest of the book is just a guideline. All righty. Uh, another question here from uh, Mark. Um, can I ask why Blue Scope has only released the documents as guidelines and have not had them certified to meet the performance standard? Tricky one. Um, it is something that we have discussed over the years, and it has certainly been, you know, there's been a lot of discussion over that, and it's something that we are still looking at. Um, it's not something that um, it, there's been a there's been a decision in the past made that it was potentially we didn't see the, the real benefit in doing it, um, but there's been you know there's certainly it's an ongoing discussion. Um, the process the process to actually certify those guidelines is, is one is one step that. Um, you know, there's been some discussions with them in the past with the regulators about. So yeah, so it's still something we are certainly certainly looking at. Great. Okay, a couple of questions here from David. Now, David's asking um, about getting access to the guidelines and using them in their own training material, and um, he's referred to the the videos that you showed during the presentation as well. So, are they available for our audience to? Uh, access, view, and and reuse in in their own organisations, or what would you suggest? So, look, um, to start with, the, any of that stuff that we've got is available to people who have agreements with us. So it's not just Blue Scope; it's people like OneSkill, 
um, SRAM and SAMS, those companies that we have agreements with, certainly have access to those guidelines as well as any of our carriers that actually transport providers, people like Toll, KNS, who work very closely with us, they also have access to that. So we've developed that and said, you know, we've got an agreement with you guys, or you guys are working for us, we're going to give you that information. Um, and so that's that's how it that's where it is at the moment. It's certainly, if people, there's there's some thoughts about also uh, widening that to allow other people to access them, but that's still there's discussions around that at this point in time. But if people were if people were wanting more information that are outside of that group and they wanted to contact me to discuss that, we could we could we could, we could, we could certainly have a look at those. Reports. Alrighty, no worries at all. Now we have had a couple of questions relating to today's presentation material and recording. Uh, so just to reiterate, uh, everyone that's participating here today will be sent a copy of the presentation material as well as the recording of today's session. So you'll be able to review that at your leisure, uh, share those with colleagues perhaps. Um, uh, yeah, as I said, uh, any time that's convenient you can have another look at that. So thank you to everyone who uh, sent through questions relating to that. Um, look, we do have a couple more questions, so we might get time for one or two more. A uh, question here from uh, Ian. Ian's asking, um, are chains used are chains used for this presentation grade 8 and 8 millimeter? So all our guidelines that we actually use are 8 millimeter chains that meet the Australian standard AS4344. That's all. All our guidelines are based on those. The only time that we've had to go to chains which are higher than that is when we've had some. We've, we had to do a guideline for one steel around excavators, and because some of those were like 60 odd ton, basically we had to go to 10 and 13 mil chains. But certainly, any of our guidelines, the minimum requirement is eight millimeter chains to AS uh, uh, AS. Uh, 43.44. Great. Well, thank you for that question, and I hope we've managed to clarify that for you. If not, get in touch with us for a bit more discussion. All right, one final question down to finish up our webinar this afternoon, or this morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, the question here from John is, uh, have you had on-road enforcement people question your guides? And if so, how would you have dealt with that? Um, so, in, in answer to that, yes, we have. We have. Um, and generally speaking, there is a fairly good relationship between Bluescope and regulators, and we have some of our senior managers are certainly um, part of logistics, the Logistics Safety Council and that type of thing. Um, in fact, one of our general managers actually leads up the, the safety committee for the for Australian Logistics Safety Council. So there's a fairly good working relationship there. There has been questions questions about it and there was a there was a case recently um, but basically was not that was raised by an inspector. We challenged that together with with others that were in that supply chain and basically that case was actually dropped before it went to Based on the fact that we had all the engineering to prove that the actual system was compliant, and what, so, so, so there is one other little bit to that as well. We are now actually um, basically adding some additional comments to our guidelines um, to basically say that they are designed to meet the Australian low restraint performance standards. So that's an additional that we're now starting to add to that to our guidelines as a as a result of that that um, case. Great. All right. Well, on that note, I will um, bid our audience farewell and take this opportunity for, um, to thank them once again for joining in today. And, and we really hope that you, you gained something valuable from today's session. Uh, as I said, if uh, there's any part of today's session that you'd like to review, uh, you will be getting that presentation material shortly. So do keep an eye on your emails. Uh, Graham, a big thank you to you for putting together this presentation and sharing your story with us. 
Uh, it's certainly been insightful for me, so um, I look forward to that uh, app becoming available, as I'm sure many of our audience is also. Yep, no problem. Pleasure. Beautiful. All right, thank you once again, and we hope you can join us for future webinars. There will be a short pop-up survey that will pop up on your screen, ladies and gentlemen, as I close down the webinar. It's just a few short questions, and if you could kindly let us know how we went today, be very grateful. Thank you all, and hope you can join us next time. Bye-bye.